All right, housing, take two. All right, so we have the impact of limited space on housing and the fact that um, we've talked about a rural versus urban um, split with people living in a countryside and people living in a city. Um, and the fact that more people in the world nowadays do live in cities, we call this trend urbanization. Um, the shift happened in the 1950s after World War II as people were leaving uh, a more uh, rural environment to go to cities to find more job opportunities. There was also a big population boom after World War II. Um, this creates a lot less space in uh, more crowded cities. This had an impact on Japanese families in the fact that we changed from an extended family situation to a more nuclear family situation. Remember that an extended family includes um, people outside of your mom, dad, and your kids. Um, so that would include grandparents, uh, maybe aunts, uncles, uh, grown children often living with their parents still in an extended family situation. However, again, in um, crowded urban space, there isn't an option for that many people to live together in a small apartment. Um, and so you have more of a shift to nuclear families instead of extended families. This also um, creates an adaptation that Japanese people have uh, done quite well at in terms of maximizing the limited space that they have, um, both in the function of their homes as well as in the products that they put into their homes. So you'll often have in a Japanese home rooms that serve more than one purpose, a room that is an office and a place to watch TV and a place where the children will sleep. Um, it's not common for every person in a Japanese family to have their own separate bedroom. Um, so you'll also then adapt your furniture as well. Um, we just had our, the opening of our own IKEA store here in Kansas City, um, and a lot of what they sell are closets. And in a lot of places, people don't have a separate room that is your closet, uh, because again, that takes up a lot of extra space. So having a place to put your clothing or your personal belongings is important. Um, and so they'll also have adjustable furniture, things that we might have heard more of here in the United States lately, um, things like futons that serve as a couch during the day and then will fold out to a bed in the evening. Um, they'll also make things a lot more smaller or um, that fit a space better, smaller appliances. Um, instead of a six burner gas stove, you may have one burner um, hot plate. You'll also, they've also adapted in some unique ways. Um, bonsai trees are very tiny trees um, that take up a lot less space and are both a recreation and an art form. Um, they've also developed square watermelons so that they'll actually fit into small refrigerators. Look it up. Um, they have capsule hotels, which is literally just enough space for you to get a good night's sleep or not so good night's sleep. Um, and so you can imagine what might be your nightly rate at a uh, hotel like this. Um, and then they also talked about the afterlife and if everyone were to be buried in their own um, plot in a cemetery, Japan would very quickly run out of space. So um, both religiously and culturally, it is much more common to be cremated in Japan than in other parts of the world. Um, so think about your own house and what items you have that take up the most space. Is there a way that you would change it to make um, better use of the space that you have or to maximize the use of the space you have? Which then takes us to overall land in general and how is that land being used? Um, when you have limited resources, that always creates conflict because somebody wants a roller skating rink, somebody wants a nature preserve, somebody wants um, a mall where they can have um, you know, jobs and make a lot of money. So there's always going to be conflict. You have to decide, are you motivated by self-interest or are you motivated by the greater good? Um, right. In the United States, we have a concept called eminent domain. And what eminent domain means is that in the United States, the government has the right or the authority to take away your personal private property um, for the greater good if they compensate you with what's considered a fair price. Um, a lot of people who've been impacted by eminent domain don't always feel that the price is fair, what they would have tried to sell it for. This often takes place um, in buildings and construction, um, especially in highways. Um, if you live near a busy street, um, if the government decides to expand the lane into your yard, you've now suddenly lost five feet of your yard. Um, and that's now a street that's 
for the public good. Um, in the Japanese example, they talked about the Narita Airport and how the community actually rallied against this growth and, um, and actually challenged people who were willing to work with the government or cooperate. So if you can't build out, then another option is to build up. And in Japan, that creates a challenge because of earthquakes and the fact that earthquakes are going to um, impact how your building structures last over time. So you're going to see a challenge in um, architecture in Japan to create buildings that are not only tall but also, also earthquake resistant. Another option, if you can't go up, is to go down. Um, and Jap Japan has actually um, expanded the use of underground resources as well to go so far as to create art museums, um, even a zoo underground, um, and make the most use of that space as well. Um, there's also a new trend, not just in Japan, but in other parts of Asia as well, to actually create new land. Um, and you can do this by backfilling in um, wetland areas, marshy, swampy areas, with additional um, gravel, dirt, to create a more stable surface. Um, it does create new land that you can expand on, but then it also um, damages very valuable habitats, habitats for um, animals, wildlife, uh, but also habitats that create a natural flood control, especially along coastal areas um, where that's vitally important. So, um, so creating new land does have both the pros and cons, and you have to weigh those carefully. We saw this in the United States after Hurricane Sandy on the East Coast, um, near New Jersey especially. Um, you're going to have also the introduction of terracing and farmland terraces that are going to allow for the production of rice on areas that normally would not have been able to produce that, um, that would have normally been considered too steep or, um, or dry. So here is the image from your textbook about growing up and growing down. And my challenge to you, or my question, is to think about as the world's population continues to grow, because we are um, projected to reach 9 billion people on the Earth's um, surface by 2050. Um, what do you think is going to happen first? Where are we going to expand to? Do you think it's more likely that we'll expand into underwater terrain? Or do you think it's more likely that we will try and expand into um, traditionally unlivable or challenging terrain like deserts, high mountain um, areas, um, tundra, frozen areas like much of Eurasia and northern Eurasia? Um, so where do you think we're going to end up as we start to run out of space? The last section talked about the impact of so many people on health and the, um, the, the health of individuals as well as the health of the, the um, country as a whole. Um, as we've seen numerous times in our study of geography, people equal pollution. We can try to live a, as eco-friendly a life as possible, but we produce waste. And in our lives, uh, as we currently live them, um, modern life creates pollution. And so we can try to manage that pollution as best we can. Um, the book mentioned the fact that a typical Tokyo resident creates two to three pounds of trash each day. Um, I think I also read somewhere that uh, Americans, we use on average six paper towels a day, um, and so imagine, multiply that by the 300 million people that are in the United States, and that's a lot of paper waste each day. Um, you're also going to see the impact in um, the rivers and waterways as garbage, sewage, um, wastewater is emptied into um, public waterways. The book mentions acid rain from factories, and just a reminder that acid rain is um, chemicals that are released from cars, from factories that mix with the air and the precipitation in the air to then create an acidic compound that will then fall as rain. Um, and they gave you the specific example of the Minamata Bay uh, when actual toxic waste was put into the water impacting the fish and as humans ate the fish. Um, it had pretty drastic consequences in terms of deformities and um, mental impairment as well as actual death. Um, the, we, we, we talked about this um, in, in other situations and we've obviously had those kinds of consequences in the United States as well. Um, our government tries to protect 
the um, the people in a society by creating fines or laws that try to prevent that kind of toxic waste. The interesting consequence in Japan is that they actually live long lives, and so they have adapted to this um, idea of pollution by recycling, um, by wearing face masks to reduce the amount of germs that can be um, transmitted. They have very strict environmental laws. In fact, the Kyoto Protocol is um, was created in the city of Kyoto in Japan as a worldwide attempt to manage the environmental impact that we're having on the world in terms of climate change. Um, and the United States did not sign that, actually. Um, as you move to a city, there are things like disease, car accidents, and crime that can um, impact you more than if you were to live in a more isolated rural environment. Um, but the Japanese have actually um, advanced their health to the point where their life expectancy is 81 years, which is even slightly higher than the United States. Um, some of that is also attributed to their diet and the fact that um, as an island nation, they do also eat a lot of seafood um, and, and limit a lot of their fatty food consumption. So adapting to the pollution, they still have a lot of trash, but um, they're trying to manage that with recycling. So what does this all mean? Um, there are more implications to population as opposed to the ones we've just talked about. Um, also on your food supply, where is the food being produced and how is it distributed out to people? Um, are, do, are there enough jobs for all of the people that are coming onto the planet? Um, as you get more people packed together, the kind of conflict and crime that can come out of that. Um, how do we educate people? How do we provide opportunities for recreation in limited space? Those are some of the challenges that I know will still continue to meet as we um, head into the future. Currently, the five most populated countries in the world are China, India, the United States, Brazil, and Indonesia, and they're projecting that India will soon overtake China as the most populated country in the world. Um, so the book mentions the fact that not all population challenges are created equal, that both India and Japan have a similar population density, but India actually has more available space and richer resources, um, yet their um, life expectancy is quite low and their poverty level is quite high. And so how India has chosen to manage its resources or has been able to due to its history, we'll be looking at that in future um, study. So keep that in mind that not all population challenges are equal. Um, they also mention in the um, global section of your text about the um, country of Bangladesh and then the small island nation of Singapore, um, which are both very, very, very highly um, densely populated, but Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries in the world while Singapore is one of the wealthiest and how they've managed the resources. So the ultimate lesson is um, in how people manage the resources that they have rather than the luck of what resources you've been provided with. We'll be examining more in general um, as we examine China and how population has impacted that country as well.